Gonzaga remained at number 11 in the AP poll while an upcoming opponent dropped out of the top 25, a disturbing trend for the Zags non-conference schedule this season. Let's break it all down. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel. Folks, make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to get started. Folks, on today's show, we are discussing Cal State Bakersfield, Gonzaga's opponent tonight. As you are listening to this on Tuesday, we're going to talk about our five things to watch for in this game. We're also going to close out the show with an update on Lisa Fortier and the Gonzaga women's basketball program, how they are performing so far, what they got to look forward to in the rest of their non-conference schedule. But before we get into either of those talk- topics, we're talking AP poll today. The Gonzaga Bulldogs remain at number 11. They have not quite been able to crack their way into the top 10 of the AP poll, despite, of course, having an undefeated record, despite a lot of teams who were kind of in that top 10, top 15 conversation, having some early season struggles. We've seen teams like Arkansas drop games. We've seen teams like Creighton dropped a game to Colorado State. They dropped about 10, I think 10 or 12 spots in the ranking. So we've seen some teams move down, but Gonzaga hasn't quite been able to climb uh, up into that top 10. As of, as of right now, the AP poll's top 10 has Purdue at number one, of course, Gonzaga's first opponent in that Maui Invitational. Arizona's number two, Marquette is number three, who lost that championship game to Purdue in Maui. UConn, future Gonzaga opponent there, they come in at number four. Kansas is five, Houston six, Duke seven, Miami eight, Baylor is nine, and then Tennessee, the Vols, who ended up losing two games in Maui. They come in at number 10. The voting was very close between Gonzaga and Tennessee. I think there's only three total points that separated those two programs. So Gonzaga was very, very close to being in that top 10 conversation. Again, Tennessee lost more games in Maui than Gonzaga did, but Tennessee's losses came against really premier opponents. They lost to Purdue and Kansas. Uh, Nothing to really shake your head at there. I think that Tennessee team is very good. But of course, I know some people will look at Tennessee having more losses than Gonzaga and be a little frustrated they're not in that top 10. Honestly, I think 11 is fine. I think you could argue probably as high as eight For Gonzaga, you could probably argue as low as 15 for Gonzaga. I wouldn't argue for them that low, but I think that there's at least a defensible argument to have them at 15 or so. Any lower than that, I think you're probably just a hater. I think Gonzaga certainly deserves to be in that 8 to 13, 14 conversation. So for me, 11 feels totally fine. They are one spot ahead of the Kentucky Wildcats, Gonzaga's opponent, of course, in February uh, as they kind of break up the WCC schedule by heading out to Lexington, Kentucky to take on John Calipari's very new look Wildcats team at Rupp Arena. That should be a really fun one, of course. Rankings are going to change a whole bunch of times between now and February, but this is still going to be a matchup between two very, very good programs. What I also want to talk about here is this trend that the teams Gonzaga scheduled in their non-conference are struggling. Not all of them, of course. We highlighted UConn. UConn's the defending national champs. They're at number four. They won their their tournament. It was the Empire Classic. They beat Indiana and Texas in that tournament, two quality programs. Indiana hasn't looked great, admittedly, but Texas is a top 25 program. UConn won both those games without Stefan Castle, their star freshman. Uh, It's unclear at this point if he will be back in time for that Gonzaga game at Climate Pledge Arena, but UConn has looked fantastic. However, San Diego State no longer in the AP top 25, and neither is USC, Gonzaga's opponent on Saturday in Las Vegas, MGM Grand. It's going to be an absolute blast of a game. Unfortunately, it will not be a game between two ranked teams as the Trojans have fallen out of the top 25. They already had that loss to Irvine, and that loss to Irvine was without, I believe, Boogie Ellis did not play in that game. I know they were missing two starters 
in that game against Irvine. I'm trying to remember exactly who they were. I think it was Ellis and Kobe Johnson. Uh, either way, that game kind of people weren't too aggressively voting down USC after losing to Irvine because of the circumstances, but then they lost to Oklahoma this last week and Oklahoma is a good program, better than many people expected. My co-host Isaac Shade and I talked about Oklahoma on the Locked On College Basketball podcast on Monday's episode. If you want to check that out, we talked about Oklahoma and BYU and how they're kind of expected to be bottom feeders in the Big 12, but both look like really, really quality programs. Speaking of BYU, they are 19th in the country right now, 6-0 and to start the season, coming off of a fifth-place finish in the WCC last year. Of course, they get their stuff together in time to play in a different conference. Frustrating to see BYU playing so well uh, in a year where they're not in the same conference as Gonzaga, especially as we've talked about recently with St. Mary's' struggles. And, and the WCC looking more like a one-bid league than a potential two- or three-bid league. And BYU being gone and being the best version of BYU that we've seen in a long time is, is certainly – a uh, frustrating reality for Gonzaga fans right now, but so is the reality that USC is not ranked anymore. And USC is going to be a, a dangerous team. They're going to be a pissed off team that they're not ranked. They know that this game against Gonzaga is their best opportunity in the short term to get back into the top 25. So Gonzaga is going to be playing a very motivated, very talented top 20, top 15 caliber team. That's going to show up as unranked in the standings. This is an objectively bad thing for Gonzaga. If they win, they beat an unranked USC team. It's still going to look good. It's still going to help them in Ken Palm. People are going to rationally understand that this is a good victory for Gonzaga, but it's not going to carry the same weight that it would have if USC was 16th or 19th or even 25th. It doesn't carry the same weight. Meanwhile, if Gonzaga loses to USC, which USC is talented enough to beat Gonzaga, there is no doubt that they are capable of pulling off that kind of win. It now looks like a much bigger upset. It now looks like an unranked team beating an 11th ranked team. And that's still true. I mean, it's not like that would be, that's misleading. That's factually accurate, but it definitely doesn't feel like a, a borderline top 10 matchup versus an unranked team. And that's what it's going to end up looking like, which is just kind of unfortunate. Obviously Gonzaga needs to take care of business. They're going to have their hands full with freshman guard, Isaiah Collier, a fantastic talent for the Trojans, again, Boogie Ellis averaging over 20 points per game, fifth-year senior guard for them. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about USC on Thursday and Friday show of Locked on Zags. We're going to have a ton of coverage on the Trojans and what this game means for Gonzaga, keys to the victory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it is unfortunate that it will be against a technically unranked USC squad when this game gets going. San Diego State, again, that game's not till late December. There's a chance the Aztecs are back in the top 25 by the time that one rolls around. They ended up finishing 27th. They had a lot of votes for top 25, but just didn't quite sneak in. St. Mary's did not get a single vote. They are off the radar right now, and frankly, probably don't have the opportunities to necessarily get back into the top 25 unless they do not lose any more games. They got Utah and Boise State this week. They need to win both of them, even if they do they might pick up some votes, but I don't think they'll actually get back into the top 25. That's probably going to require one, maybe two victories against the Zags for them to be back in that conversation. Quick shout as well before we move on and start talking about Cal State Bakersfield. Anton Watson picked up WCC Player of the Week award. First time in his career as a fifth-year senior that Watson has been the WCC Player of the Week. Incredibly well-deserved after he dropped a career-high 32 points on 14 of 15 shooting against UCLA in the fifth place game in the Maui Invitational. He completely earned that WCC Player of the Week award. He was also named to the all Maui team, a five player kind of roster of guys who did really well in the Maui Invitational. Anton Watson on that list alongside a pair of Purdue Boilermakers in Zach Eady and Braden Smith. Dalton Connect at Tennessee, fantastic transfer addition for them. Oso Igadaro from Marquette, their big man who's played extremely well. And then, of course, Hunter Dickinson from Kansas. Really nice uh, group of players right there. And Anton Watson completely deservedly in the mix right there for them. Let's talk about those Roadrunners, Cal State Bakersfield, a team who has plummeted at the Ken Palm ranking since the start of the season. Shouldn't pose a huge threat to Gonzaga, but that doesn't mean there's not plenty of fun stuff we're going to be looking for in that game. All that coming up after a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. Folks, score early this college basketball season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if in your pocket if your team wins. 
So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time than right now to get in on the action. The app is insanely easy for folks to use. There is a wide range of betting options, which includes spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. Right now, the Zags currently have 801 odds to find themselves in the final four. So if you're feeling good about this iteration of Mark Few's Bulldogs, you want to put $25 down on the Zags in the final four that third, fourth week in March. You might not only be celebrating a final four appearance for the Zags, you might have a couple hundred more bucks in your pocket as well. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the college basketball season. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. Today's episode of Locked on Zags is also brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Folks, these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best and most qualified candidates available. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which helps find the right people for your team faster. And they do it for free. It's super easy to create a free job post. And then you just add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. From there, simple tools like screening questions can make it easy to prioritize the candidates that have just the right skills and experience so you can figure out who you'd like to interview and ultimately hire. It's part of the reason small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Folks, want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen or your first watch of the day. Shout out to those everyday listeners. Shout out to those of you on our Discord channel as well, talking Zags 24-7 over there. The link is in the show notes. Click there. You will join us, and we'll be able to talk throughout all these game threads as we got two more fun Gonzaga basketball games this week, including tonight. For those of you listening on Tuesday, November 28th, 6 p.m. Pacific time, the Zags will host the Roadrunners, of Cal State Bakersfield. The game will be on ESPN Plus for out-of-market users. It'll be on Root Sports for those of you in the Seattle, Portland area. And then it'll, of course, be on KHQ in Spokane again. If you are looking for ways to watch the game and you're hope hoping for some help on that, we're talking about it in the Discord before every game, helping people make sure they can find ways to screen the game. It's a great spot to, to get some assistance there. But let's talk about this Cal State squad. They're the only Big West opponent of the season for Gonzaga. Gonzaga usually plays one or two different Big West teams every single year, it feels like. Uh, this is the only one that ended up on the schedule this year. Gonzaga ended up playing a whole bunch of SWAC teams, which we'll get into some of those games later, Mississippi Valley State, Jackson State, et cetera, et cetera. But the Roadrunners have not been a particularly good team this year. I believe they began the season at like 228, 228. 30, somewhere in there in the Ken Palm rankings. They are all the way down to 314th at Ken Palm as we're recording this right now on Monday afternoon. They're 3-3 three and three on the season. Wins are over Southern Utah and Sacramento State are their two Division I victories. They also have a victory over, over St. Catherine, a non-Division I school. Their losses come to USC, so of course some familiarity there. Cal, also in the, in the Pac-12, and then Tarleton State in the WAC. So 3-3 three and three on the season. 314th at Ken Palm, evenly balanced in terms of their offense and defense, not in a particularly good way. I should add their adjusted offense at Ken Palm is 303rd. Their adjusted defense at Ken Palm is 306th. And tempo-wise, this is a key for Gonzaga. They are at 343, meaning they are one of the 20 slowest paced teams in all of college basketball. It's the team that isn't going to, to get out and transition very much. I don't think they'd be able to do that against Gonzaga all that well. Anyway, they run a pretty slow-paced offense, but frankly, there's just not a lot of offense here in general. Caleb Higgins is their leading scorer. He's averaging 16.3 points per game, also 3.2 assists. He's the only guy on their team over eight points per game. That's it. Higgins is shooting 21.4% from three, which is only slightly below the team's average. The team as a collective unit, under 24% from three and under 43% from the field. Folks, this is a bad basketball team. 
There's really not any other way to spin this. The Big West is, is not a great basketball conference, although they have some solid teams. Irvine has looked good. Uh, Santa Barbara has a very talented roster. Long Beach State pulled off a great upset over Michigan earlier this year. Again, Irvine beat uh, uh, USC, excuse me. So there is some talent in the Big West. Bakersfield just doesn't have it. They're just not the team that's going to give Gonzaga much trouble here. But that means there's a lot of good stuff that could come out of this game. It's going to be more competitive than Eastern Oregon. It's going to be less competitive than Yale. It's going to be a good game for Gonzaga to get some of their younger guys some more run to maybe try some new things uh, without having to worry too much about the score. So here are my five keys. Again, uh, for those of you who've been listening to the show uh, throughout the season, you know that we try to do either five keys to victory or five things to watch kind of based on the opponent. I don't think we need to do a keys to victory here for Gonzaga. So it's more about what are we going to be looking for? In this game, what specifically am I going to be taking notes on? What specifically am I going to be talking about on Wednesday's show after we watch this game? So we'll start with the guard minutes. Lots of Luka Krinovich is what I am hoping to see in this game. It is a big talking point around Gonzaga basketball right now. We led with it on Monday's show for Mailbag, for those of you who checked it out. Ryan Nemhard, Nolan Hickman, Dusty Stromer played all 40 minutes against UCLA. Ryan Nemhard has barely been on the bench this season. That is also true of Nolan Hickman. Those guys are playing just about every single minute of every single game. This is an opportunity for them to not have to do that. There is no reason for Ryan Nembard to play more than 28 minutes per game. He might not even play 25. He probably shouldn't, unless, of course, something is going terribly wrong and Gonzaga needs him to remain competitive in the contest. That would be a worst-case scenario, and we'd have other things on our mind if that were the situation, but there's no reason for Nemar to play more than 25, 28. No reason for Hickman or Dusty to play more than 30 or so minutes either. What that means is there should be a lot of Luka Krinovich. Ideally, he plays 15 or so minutes in this game, maybe more. The Zags need him to be a rotation piece. I talked about this on Monday's show. I mean, there's they need him. There's no debate. There's no question. They need Luka Krinovich because they do not have anybody else. That's not a knock on Luka. I think he is a capable player. I think he's just, his, his development has been sped up. The plan likely was to have this be more of a developmental year for Luka because he didn't get to campus until September. He's adjusting to the speed and the and the difference in, in American college basketball from where he played in Croatia. He's understanding Gonzaga's offense. I mean, he just got here. So getting under so understanding the, the offense and how to run the systems, I mean, it's complicated. Gonzaga is not a simple offensive or defensive team by any stretch. And I think the plan was for Luca to learn that gradually over the course of a year, playing primarily in garbage time and then take on a bigger role next season. He doesn't have that opportunity because of the Steel Venters injury. He needs to play now. And Mark Few did not play him in that UCLA game, but this is the kind of game that you play him. You get him those on-ball reps. Playing in, in scrimmages, in practices is different. Showing that he can run the offense, facilitate, play defense, be in the right positions. I don't need him to make every shot. I don't need him to do anything incredibly acrobatic or, or like jaw dropping. I just need to see that he can go out there and capably run the offense. Doing it against Cal State Bakersfield's backups isn't a – you're not going to learn a ton necessarily because that's not a particularly good group of players, but it's those reps that are necessary for Luca to get better and to be a guy who can be – a 10 to 15 minute per game player during the conference play because they need him to be. They don't have a choice. He needs to be that guy that cannot play Ryan Nembhard 38 minutes a night. They might, they might. And we're probably going to be a little critical of that if it happens, but they, Luca needs to be somebody who they can rely on. And this is the kind of game where you get those opportunities. A couple more takeaways here. That's the biggest one, or I guess uh, keys, things I'll be watching for. Basically the same notes on Jun Suk Yo as well. I don't think they're as reliant on Jun to, to step into a bigger role. I, Luka's kind of more the, the, the player they need to be that guy because he plays a guard position. But seeing Yo get more opportunity, uh, giving a, a bigger rest for Dusty, potentially letting Dusty play some more minutes at the two and, and having Hickman and or Nemhard play more minutes or ha play more, come off the bench in those situations as opposed to having to play the entire game. Yo at the three, Dusty at the two, Hickman or Nemhard at the one is a lineup I'd like to see in this game, seeing Yo get more comfortable, get more confident, uh, you know, start to show some of that offensive skills that we know are there would be a huge key in this one. Next up, I'm hoping for a big comeback from Braden Huff. Huff did not look like the same player in Maui. We're not shocked by that, 
At least we should not be shocked by that. Uh, the competition level between Yale and Lewis Clark State, the exhibition game, and of course, Eastern Oregon, is dramatically different than the competition he faced in the Maui Invitational. We saw him drop six points against Purdue. He had nine against Syracuse. He did not score in that foul fest that was the game against the UCLA Bruins. But I expect him to bounce back. I expect a 15 to 20 point game off the bench for Braden Huff. That has been who he is so far this season. That is who I expect to see. USC will be an interesting test of which Braden Huff do we actually see? Does he come off the bench and score in double figures against USC? Is he really quiet in that game? What does that look like? But for Bakersfield, there's a real opportunity for him to come back and, and be that high-level scorer off the bench that we've seen from him the first couple of games of the season. Number four, can Gonzaga's outside shooting show up? This is the kind of team you do that against. Home floor, you're familiar with the rims, you're playing an opponent that is not nearly as good at you as you and is not as capable of defending you from the three-point line. This is a great game for Nolan Hickman and Ryan Nembhard to ball out and hit those threes and then hit the bench. And then from there, Dusty Stromer should be hitting threes, Luka Krinovich hitting threes, Jun Suk Yo hitting threes. Like I don't, I'm, I don't, it doesn't need to be like 15 threes in this game or anything. They're not going to need it. I think it's easy to get to the basket against this team, and perhaps they won't even take that many threes, but the three-point shooting has been bad so far this season, and this would be a good opportunity to kind of bump up the percentage a little bit and get some guys a bit more confident with that outside shot. Scoring in transition, uh, hitting open threes off the pick and roll, pick and pops, like just being more comfortable with taking those shots and seeing them go through the basket. That's the kind of thing you take out of a game like this. And then finally, against opponents like this, this is probably always going to be one of the things I mentioned. Let's see some walk-on minutes. And when I say walk-on minutes, I'm also counting Pavel Stosic, the uh, Croatian forward who came over, excuse me, Serbian forward, who came over in late September, joined this roster, uh, didn't play in the first few games of the season. We saw a few minutes from him in that Eastern Oregon game. Uh, Mark Few mentioned that he'd had a concussion, and that was why he didn't play earlier. We're expecting he's not redshirting. We did not see him in any of the games uh, in the Maui Invitational, but that is not at all a surprise. It's possible they'll choose to redshirt him. They still have the ability to do that. But if they do not, this would be a good opportunity for him to get some floor minutes. Colby Brooks, Joe Few, hopefully we get a chance to see those guys out on the floor as well. well we're going to close out today's show discussing the Lady Zags and how they are looking after a tough loss to Louisville coming up after a word from today's sponsor, Prize Picks. Folks, PrizePix offers weekly promotions that can lead you to big payouts like their Taco Tuesday deal. So for today, every Tuesday, PrizePix discounts select player projections up to 25% to provide you with even more value. Plus, with PrizePix reboot policy, your entries will stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. So for NFL games and college football top 25 matchups, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and they do not return in the second half, that player is rebooted. PrizePix is the only daily fantasy sports platform with injury insurance. Seriously, this is unprecedented in the DFS space. Beyond all of that, PrizePix is also just really easy to use. All you have to do is pick two or more players and choose more or less with whatever given stat there is. So you go to the NBA tab, you see Chet Holmgren over under 18 and a half points. You're hitting over because Chet's been dropping 20 a night lately for the Oklahoma City Thunder. He hits over that. You get paid. So go to prizepix.com slash college. Use that promo code LockedOnCollege for a first deposit match of up to $100. Again, that's prizepix.com slash college. Use promo code LockedOnCollege for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize picks. It's daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, folks, closing out the show today. Talking about Lisa Fourier and the Lady Zags. We did touch on them on Monday show, Mailbag Monday. A couple questions at the end of the show talking about the women's team and their non-conference schedule. So uh, if you listen to that, you'll hear some of the same stuff here. But really wanted to get, give an opportunity to just kind of fully dive in to what this season has been like so far for the women's basketball team and, and kind of what's coming up next. Right now, the Lady Zags are 6-2. and two. On the season, they got wins over Montana on the road. That was their season opener. They got wins at home against Toledo, North Florida, Wyoming, and Liberty. And then they got a neutral site victory over Alabama. That led them into the championship game of the tournament they were playing in over Feast Week, where they lost 
to then number 20 ranked Louisville. This game just happened a few days ago. Uh, Gonzaga was in it, down two, heading into the fourth quarter. Unfortunately, in the fourth quarter, Louisville really pulled away in a significant way and, and, and drowned the Zags, but still really nice performance from them. Their only losses come to Louisville, again, 20th in the country at the time, and then on the road against Washington State, who was number 24 at the time. So they got themselves some quality wins. They got themselves a pair of quality losses as well. And that resulted in them getting a couple of votes in the recent AP poll. Just three votes, so not a significant amount, but still showing some love, getting some attention and interest from the AP voters. That's a really good sign for this Gonzaga team. Uh, Washington State, who again Gonzaga lost to, did fall out of the rankings. They did receive 55 votes. They were very close. I think they were 26th, actually, or 27th. Uh, so just missed being in that top 25. Louisville did drop from 20 to 22. Meanwhile, Alabama also received votes. In fact, they received three more votes than Gonzaga, despite the fact that Gonzaga beat them. Not really a huge deal since neither team is actually ranked, but still, again, some love for Gonzaga. Probably not as much as there maybe should be, especially if Alabama's getting more votes than them, but still a, a team that's kind of on the periphery of being a top 25 team. Now, Zags are really riding their starting five. This is a team that has some depth. We didn't see a lot of those, uh, a lot of the, the bench players play in that Louisville game. We've kind of seen, similar to how Mark Few is operating with the men's team, uh, Lisa Fortier is really going hard with that starting lineup, and, and it's a really experienced group of starters. You have the Trong Twins as well as Vonnie Ejim, uh, Brenna Maxwell, and Eliza Hollinsworth, all of them averaging in double figures led by Ejim, who's at 18.8 points, nine boards, or excuse me, uh, eight boards, three assists, shooting about 68% from the field. My goodness. She is having a WCC player of the year caliber season. In fact, she should be the front runner by a fairly significant margin at this point. Kaylee Trung is averaging 16 and a half points on 44% shooting from deep. Her sister, Kaylin Trung, is averaging 11 and a half points and six assists per game. She's also shooting about 43% from deep as well. Brenna Maxwell, who shot over 50% from three last year, has seen that dip a little in the early going. She's still at 37 and a half percent, however, so still some good numbers there. And then Eliza Hollinsworth, 10.3 points, six and a half boards, two assists, one and a half steals and one block. She is lighting it up. If you had a college women's basketball fantasy league, you would love to have Eliza on the roster. She does a little bit of everything. She's also shooting a clean 35% from three as well. But again, the bench depth just hasn't been there. 48's team is only playing two players off the bench who are playing more than seven minutes per game. Uh, Mod, see, I apologize. I don't know how to pronounce Mod's last name. Mod uh, Hubens and Callie Stokes. Mod's averaging seven points, three boards in about 21 minutes. Callie's averaging just under three points and just under four boards in 16 minutes. Outside of that, they're just not getting a ton of contribution from those bench players, something that we'll have to kind of monitor as this team gets into conference play. Still got plenty of, of elite non-conference games to play before that point, though. Uh, their next game will be on Wednesday on the road, heading down I-90 to go to Cheney, Washington to take on Eastern Washington Eagles. That game will be at 6 p.m. on Wednesday evening. Then the big one. Every year, the big game for Gonzaga, they are hosting Stanford number three ranked team in the country. This game will be on Sunday. So if you're still nursing a bit of a hangover after that late night Gonzaga USC game in, the, in Sin City, you got a 1 p.m. tip for Gonzaga Stanford again at the McCarthy Athletic Center. That's going to be an absolute blast of a game. I think I'm going to be flying back from Las Vegas around that time. Hopefully I'll find an opportunity to get that game streaming somehow. The Zags then play at Cal and at Rice later in that week. They'll at Cal on the 7th of December at 7 p.m. and then at Rice two days later on the 9th at noon. That's a lot of good opportunities to pick up some marquee wins. They got Arizona in the non-conference and South Dakota State in the non-conference as well before they get into WCC play. Not a great year for the WCC. Similar to on the men's side, BYU's women's team is ranked after being bad last year. It feels like BYU just kind of punted their last season of basketball in the WCC, but suddenly feeling a lot better as they get into the Big 12. A little bit frustrating to see that happen. Uh, this Gonzaga women's team is going to have to do everything they can to make their net rankings sparkly pretty uh, before the conference season starts because it's going to take a hit as they get into the WCC, but they've done some really great work so far, and hopefully they can continue that. Uh, we'll see if they end up beating Stanford, but even a close game against the Cardinal is a huge uh, 
it's a, a win for them metaphorically. And if they can take take care of business against Rice and Cal on the road, take care of business at home against Arizona and South Dakota State, this team's going to be in good shape heading into conference play. That's going to wrap us up for today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Thank you so much for making this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Shout out to those everyday listeners. Shout out to those of you hanging out with us in the Discord as well. Again, you can click that link and join us whenever you're up to it. It is in the show notes for both YouTube and whatever your preferred podcast platform is. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back on Wednesday with a recap of Gonzaga's game over a game against Cal State Bakersfield. We'll talk a little bit about how things are shaking out in the WCC as well. All that coming up on Wednesday's show. Thanks again for making the show your first listen. And until next time, as always, go Zags.